Thank you for being here this morning for our annual 8th grade Memorial Day assembly. Memorial Day weekend is a weekend that we honor those that have made the ultimate sacrifice for our country. So we prepared an outstanding program for you today. And before we get started, we have three of our wonderful 8th grade students that are going to sing the national anthem. Up front with me, I have Victoria Lafarge, Juanita Feeney, and Isabella Fraga. I'm going to turn it over to them. Please rise. So proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight. O'er the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming, and the Before we get started today, there are some people that I would like to thank that make this assembly possible. There's a lot of planning that goes into this and it starts a long time ago. But um, there are some people in particular that we need to thank this morning for being here. First, our keynote speaker, Paul Monty. Mr. Paul Monty, thank you for being with us today. You, you will hear from Mr. Monty a little bit later in our program. He's our keynote speaker today. And then we also have our wonderful eighth grade, our seventh, eighth, and ninth grade honors band. Thank you, honors band, and Mr. Curvo. In addition, we have our chorus, our wonderful eighth grade chorus, led by Miss Betty Bowman. Thank you, eighth grade chorus. We had, we had Mr. Homer, our, our building custodian, helping with setup today. Thank you, Mr. Homer. We have a guest of honor today. You may recognize him. This, this gentleman has been connected to the middle school for many years, and it is wonderful that he can be here this morning, Mr. Joe DeVito. Mr. Joe DeVito, give everyone a name. I'll talk about Mr. Joe DeVito and the, the greatest generation in a moment. Um, and finally, uh, Ms. Caitlin Valer, 8B Social Studies. So Ms. Valer's attention to detail and the preparation that she puts into not only our Memorial Day Assembly, but our Veterans Day Assembly goes above and beyond. And we're very fortunate to have her here at this school and getting this set up for us. So thank you, Ms. Valer. So in eighth grade, I know, and we know, your teachers know that um, a big part of the curriculum is learning about our country, you know, learning about wars and learning about US history, which is a very interesting topic. And as you know, throughout the year, there are certain holidays that are very patriotic and they're very important to our country and the history behind those holidays is very important for you to understand as we explained during our veterans day program veterans day is on november 11th 
every year. I don't know if you realize that. And the reason why it's on November 11th is because World War I, which the United States involvement occurred about exactly 100 years ago, World War I ended on the 11th day, the 11th hour, on the 11th month. That's why we have Veterans Day on November 11th. Memorial Day is always the last weekend in May. Veterans Day and Memorial Day are different. Veterans Day is where we honor everyone that has served in this country. The millions of men and women that have served this country since revolutionary times. That is the purpose of Veterans Day. And it's a great time for us to do that. And you may recall we had veterans that came in from different conflicts and different wars um, for our Veterans Day assembly. And that was a wonderful event. Memorial Day is a more solemn event. It's a more solemn occasion. It's a more solemn weekend. Memorial Day is where we're focused on the men and women that have made the ultimate sacrifice for this country. And Memorial Day, is some, that's something to keep in mind as you have a long weekend. That on Memorial Day and this weekend, this is when we think and we're, we're thinking always of the people that have made the sacrifices for this country, the ultimate sacrifice. And that's our focus this morning, is remembering those. Whenever we have a chance to talk to veterans, um, whether it was at the VFW installation of officers on Sunday, where there were some middle school kids that were there, and that was outstanding, um, or anywhere else that you run into a veteran, they always talk about those that were not able to come back. And that's the purpose of this morning, for you to understand that a little bit better. And hopefully this weekend, we're gonna go over some activities that you could get involved and show your appreciation to these men and women that have sacrificed so much, not only them, but their families in addition. So Stoughton has a proud history of service to this country. And if you go on the Stoughton History website, you can find a list of all of Stoughton's fallen soldiers. Now, as you take a look at this list, and we will post this list, and thank you to Jeff Pickett and Smack for televising this because you'll see this information more. But when you look up there at those names, these are the names that you should recognize in town. Your street names. For example, my street name is, is named after um, a gentleman who served in World War II who was killed in action. John Wynn Fiske. There are other street names up here that you may recognize. Or Memorial Squares. This is how our town helps recognize those that have made the ultimate sacrifice. And look at those lists of names, starting with revolutionary times, continuing into the Civil War, World War I, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, It wasn't long ago that when you were in high school, when you were 17 or 18 years old, most of your classmates were going to serve. Up at Stoughton High School, hundreds of kids have served their country over the years. If you go to the Jones Elementary School, you'll see a plaque of Jones School students that attended that school that gave their lives for this country. All those memorial squares around town, there's meaning behind those. Think about that. And if you're on a street that's existed in Stoughton for a long time, there is a very good chance that your street is named after a soldier that served this country and made the ultimate sacrifice. If you want to learn more, just go to the Stoughton History website. They have profiles. Now, I've highlighted a few because their stories, I read their stories, and it just connected. I thought back to when I was a student up at Stoughton High School. So Herbert Lawrence Connell served in World War I. He was a private in the US Army. And during World War I, hundreds of thousands of American high school kids signed up to serve. Mr. Connell was killed in action in France. He went to Stoughton High School. I started reading his story. He went to the same church that I went to. He, when you go up to Stoughton High School, he could have sat in the same seat or maybe even the same classroom. So that's Mr. Connell. 
Zygmunt Paskus, World War II, one of the soldiers that made the ultimate sacrifice was a sergeant in the US Army, G Company, 3rd Platoon. Zygmunt Paskus, this name stands out to me personally being from Stoughton because Paskus Street, which is up off of School Street, you may know where it is, is a street that I grew up playing basketball and baseball and all sorts of other sports with my friends. So I was curious to know what his story was. And I'm even more curious now. And I was doing some research on Zygmunt Paskus last night. And I could tell that he was in Hawaii. And then from there, the, re the research was tougher to do. But these stories are very important to, to focus on. And the other soldier that I wanted to focus on is Paul Sawanka. So Paul Sawanka served in Vietnam. But Paul's story is, is a story like a lot of families have faced. Paul Sawanka was, was courageous in battle and died in battle against a, a, a dug in entrenched North Vietnamese unit. Um, but the, he came under such heavy fire and his comrades came under such heavy fire that they were not able to pull his body they were not able to pull him out. It was too dangerous for them to do that. Now in Vietnam, the jungle and the terrain is, is very difficult to find somebody. And there were thousands, and there still are thousands of American soldiers that were missing in action. They were, we were not able to recover them. So Paul Sawanka's family always wondered what happened to him. In the late 1990s, some remains were found in Vietnam. Our country kept going back trying to find Paul. And finally, in 2005, they were able to identify Paul. Paul went to Stoughton schools. If you drive up on 139 or Pleasant Street, there's a memorial square named after him. His story is a, a story like a lot of high school students. I've talked to people about Paul. He was a wonderful guy. He had a great personality. They said, you know, he wasn't the best student in school, but he tried hard. He had a, great, a lot of great friends, and he really wanted to serve his country. And that story you hear over and over and over again. But these men and women, they have strong connections to Stoughton and strong connections to you. And I know a lot of your family members have served. So it's with a lot of pride and honor that we think about Memorial Day. So, what can you do? If Mr. Pizarro was here right now, he would be talking about exactly what I'm gonna talk to you about. Stoughton has a bunch of events going on this weekend. So, um, we put a flag on the graves of um, soldiers that have served this country. There are two cemeteries, the one on Central Street um, near the courthouse, and then the cemetery across from Town Spa. If you would like to be part of that, process, you can show up at one of those cemeteries tomorrow at 10 a.m. And there'll be a graves officer there with the flags, and you can help out with that. That's one way that you can show that you're thankful. Um, the other way, um, and this is where we see a lot of middle school kids and a lot of former middle school kids, is the Memorial Day Parade on Monday morning. Um, the parade um, is going to form at 9, but at 10.15 at the town hall, they'll be doing a ceremony. And they'll be reading the names of every soldier from Stoughton that has made the ultimate sacrifice. It's very powerful, and if you can be there, um, that, is, that is great. That's something that you can do. Okay, so for the next part of the program, I'm gonna turn it over to Ms. Valair, and she is gonna talk about Paul Monty's son, Jared, and then Paul will speak to you about Jared. So, Ms. Valair. Thank you, Mr. Gulia. Do you appreciate the opportunity to live in a free, safe, and strong country? Do you like having the power to have a voice and make decisions for yourself? Do you enjoy having countless freedoms and rights? I ask these questions to you this morning because you've probably never considered the alternative. So let me tell you what it is. Fear, submission, 
control, imprisonment, subjection, silence. Living every day as a free citizen is something you should all truly be thankful for. So to whom do we give thanks? Well, you should thank your parents, your family, your friends, your teachers, your community, but most importantly, you should thank your veterans. Throughout America's history, our veterans have all shared a very important trait, and that's their unwavering and undying love for America. A veteran's love for his country and comrades is so strong, he is actually willing to lay down his own life to protect them. Cherish your rights and freedoms always, but be sure to recognize that freedom is not free. Freedom is not free because it's cost the lives of hundreds of thousands of American soldiers, and this includes the life of Jared Monty. For those of you who don't know his story, I'm gonna show a little video clip. your brother before yourself. The greatest thing a man can do is to give up his life for his brother. Um, care about others. And here's a kid who epitomized every single one of those virtues that you hear about. Jared was the kind of kid who, you know, there's always one that's always at the emergency room. He, that was him. He was very outgoing. He always had that grin, and he was always up to something. And it's that phenomenal smile, that grin that he had, that everybody that knows him remembers. He was always looking out for other people. That's, you know, that's the way he was brought up. I know he gave away a kitchen table to a family. It was a single dad that needed a kitchen table, so he gave this dad his kitchen table. I remember his roommate was so mad. But he was so quiet about it, he never talked about it. I, I think he just did what he did because it came from his heart. Jared joined the Army because he wanted uh, money to go to college, so he joined the National Guard first. And there was some trepidation as to uh, you know him getting in and what might happen. So I felt good, proud, but at the same time, really a little apprehensive. He took it very seriously, so he left the guard and went regular army. It really wasn't until I went to visit him at Fort Bragg in North Carolina. That gave me the clearest picture of how he really was in the military. I, I got it. I mean, it was such a brotherhood. He was so close to them. And that's when I completely understood why he stayed in the military. He just loved his guys. For a lot of people, um, uh, the values that we live were just words. So Armani actually lived those values. They became a part of them. His commanding officer came over to me, and he, he would call generals over and he'd say, watch Monty with his men. He just had a way with them. He believed in his guys, and that's what ultimately what it came down to. You know, he was going to do whatever it took to take care of his boys, and that's what happened. Sergeant First Class Monty's 16-man patrol came under attack by a superior force consisting of as many as 50 enemy fighters. And all of a sudden, we just received a call that there were troops in contact. We took fire, and you know, we returned fire back, and it was just one bad thing after another. A copy, danger close. Jared then realized that one of his soldiers, Private Brian Bradbury, was lying wounded and exposed to enemy fire. Reports were coming in slowly that we had received wounded. Bradbury had been shot in the shoulder. With complete disregard for his own safety, Jared moved from behind the cover of the rocks. Twice he tried to reach Brian's side. He was maybe three feet away from him, but every time he tried to get up, it stopped shooting at him. Each time, rifle and RPG fire forced him back. Brian was open, he was wounded, 
and they were still shooting him, and he saw that he was being shot. And I think he just he could get him out of there. Unwilling to leave his soldier wounded and exposed, Jared tried a third time. served his country because that was the right thing to do. That's, that's trying to save Bradbury was the right thing to do. That's all there was. I've come to the, the conclusion, it, the only way I can live with it is that it was just his destiny. This is what he was meant to do. He wasn't looking for glory. He didn't want to be a hero, but you know, part of the soldier's creed is you never leave anyone behind. He wouldn't. He couldn't. The medal, he would be embarrassed, number one, to receive it. I would say to you, do you believe this? And he would say, uh, yeah, I guess, Dad, you know, um, but I was only doing what I was supposed to do. Um, and he would have that shy grin on his face. To him, it would represent every single soldier, marine, sailor, whoever. This is for them. This soldier is for all of them, all of them. Jared would want to be remembered as the guy that did the right thing, period. On Memorial Day, we remember and thank all of the brave soldiers who gave the ultimate sacrifice, soldiers like Jared Monty. We also remember the families of the fallen on Memorial Day, providing to them constant support and the confidence that we will always honor and appreciate the sacrifices their loved ones have made. A former Stoughton High School teacher and Jared's dad, Mr. Paul Monty, continues to serve as a strong and influential leader in the community. Spreading awareness of veterans and all they do for this wonderful country, Mr. Monty organized the Flags for Vets program in his son's honor, which places an American flag at each of the 77,000 graves at Bourne National Cemetery every Veterans Day and Memorial Day. Mr. Monty has influenced millions of Americans through the hit country song, I Drive Your Truck. Mr. Monty inspired Nashville songwriters to create Lee Bryce's number one hit during a Memorial Day interview on National Public Radio in 2011, one in which he described dri driving Jared's truck to feel more connected to his lost son. The song has reached the hearts of many, especially other Gold Star families who have lost a soldier in combat, helping them cope with their enormous loss and honor the sacrifices their son, daughter, brother, sister, husband or wife made for America. On behalf of the O'Donnell Middle School, I would like to personally thank Mr. Monty for his continued strength, leadership, and inspiration. I want to assure him that we students and staff are grateful always for our rights and freedoms, and we are also forever thankful for our veterans. I am confident that on this upcoming Memorial Day and every Memorial Day to follow, we will all honor America's soldiers and pay tribute to those who made the ultimate sacrifice for us. We will always remember Jared Monty and his remarkable story, and we will never forget that freedom is not free. Please welcome to the podium, Mr. Paul Monty. Good morning, O'Donnell Middle School. Good morning. Oh my goodness, you're all still asleep. Good morning, O'Donnell Middle School. Good morning! Much better. It's wonderful to be back here in Stoughton. I spent my entire teaching career, 36 years, at the high school teaching ninth grade science. Um, and it's just a warm feeling to always be able to come back here um, to the Stoughton school system. It it's, strikes home when Mr. Guglia puts these names up 
of Stoughton residents that serve because I recognize those names as students that I had in class. Not that I had the World War I guy, um, but I probably could have. Um, but I did have relatives of these people, um, Zwankas and uh, Poshkas. I, I, I had those in, in school myself. So um, that's a pretty wonderful thing to be able to um, reminisce with that. And um, I also had Mr. Googlier in class. And you know what? He still owes me homework. <laughs> Plus a couple of sessions after school. And we'll, we'll, we'll get you for that. Um, and, and what's nice is some of your faculty members also sat in my class. And um, that's, again, a good feeling. So it's, it's very, very nice to be back here and speaking with you guys this morning. Um, it's difficult for me. It's been 11 years since my son was killed. But time stopped completely. It's like it was yesterday. It's like I still see those men in uniform walking down my driveway to knock on the door to say to me, we regret to inform you. And so the emotions are still there. Now, I hope you understand what Memorial Day is all about. The presentations that you just saw hopefully enlighten you that Memorial Day is not about barbecues, it's not about trips to the beach, it's not about parties. It's not a happy day. It's really kind of inappropriate to walk up to someone and say, hey, happy Memorial Day. I mean, that's like someone walking up to you and saying, hey, happy your grandmother died day. And I hate to be that blunt, but that's exactly what you need to know. Hey, happy your brother just passed away. Yeah. It's a solemn day. It's a sad day. It's a day when we want to honor those that gave us the freedom to have those barbecues, to go to the beach, to go to the movies, to go to the mall, to watch television, to come to school. Because they don't have that in other countries. They don't. In many countries in the world, no females are allowed to go to school. How about that, girls? You can't be anything. You stay home, cook and clean, and raise children. That's it. You can't be anything. We have freedom in this country. Freedom for everyone. Not just one person. Not just one group. Not just the rich, but for everyone. But you know something? Freedom is not free. When you're born, you don't get a, a ticket that says, here, you are freedom. It's free. It's not free. It's not paid for with dollars. Paid for with blood. It's paid for with lives. Lives of young men and young women who on their own volunteer to go in the service 
and say, I'm going to protect the freedom of the United States of America against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Don't mess with my country. Or you have to mess with me. My son was one of those. When he was a junior in high school, he came, he came home from school, sat down with his dad, and said, hey dad, I have a paper I want you to sign. I want to join the Army, Dad. He was only 17, so he couldn't join without a parental signature. That's him answering. And Dad said, oh, no, 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 no. You're a really good student. You're going to college. But Dad, you can't afford to send me to college. Oh, don't worry about it, Jared. I'll get an extra job. And we'll take care of that. Dad, you're already working two and three jobs. And since it was just the National Guard, Dad said, all right, I'll sign your paper. You do a few years in the Guard, and you'll pay for your college tuition. So that summer, while all his friends were having fun, going to the beach, partying, he was down at Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri, in the heat and humidity, marching, learning how to be a soldier. Now the next year, he was a senior. He again came to Dad, said, hey, Pop. I kind of like this military stuff. I'm going to transfer from the guard to the regular army. What do you think, Dad? There he is again. I don't even know where he is. You know I should have shut that off. Sorry about that. He had all the arguments, but he was 18 now, so it was his choice. And off he went to the regular army. He went to Fort Sill in Oklahoma to learn how to be a forward observer. Of all things to be, forward observer. It's like the suicide squad. Because you spend most of your time behind enemy lines, hiding out, observing the enemy, and reporting back. <coughs> From there, he was off Fort Bragg, North Carolina, where he became a paratrooper. Loved to jump out of airplanes. Broke every bone in his back. Hit fractures all up and down his spine. You know, when they land, you see them on TV, they land and they go right up and, oh, that's wonderful. Ah, heck no. They land on their back, they land on their head, they land on their stomach, they land on their side. Anyway, from there it was off to South Korea, where he served with distinction. And then to Bosnia. I don't know if you've heard of that before. When we went to Bosnia, we helped the people there earn their freedom. From Bosnia, it was back to South Korea again, where he served on the DMZ, demilitarized zone, the line between North Korea and South Korea, where he was shot at every day. It was just normal practice for the North Koreans to shoot at the people on the other side. From there, he went to Fort Drum in upstate New York. And from Fort Drum, it was off to Afghanistan, 
where he fought. He earned himself a Bronze Star, an Army Commendation Medal with a V for Valor. Back to Fort Drum. And then in 2006, it was back to Afghanistan. I got a phone call It was June 18th, 2006, 7.30 in the morning. I was still in bed. Phone rang. Who the heck is calling me at 7.30 in the morning on a Sunday on Father's Day? Hello? Hi, Pop, how are you doing? It was my Jared calling from Afghanistan on a satellite phone, because they didn't have these cell phones then. We talk like fathers and sons do. And they said, hey, Pop, I gotta go, we're going on a mission. Okay, son, be careful. Keep your head down. Three days later, a car pulled up in the driveway. Nine forty-five, June twenty-first, two thousand six. Nine forty-five. Who's coming to my house at nine forty-five? Two soldiers in uniform. And I knew then. Mr. Monty, we regret to inform you. Your son has been killed in Afghanistan. It's like it happened yesterday. Who was this young man that was killed? Let me tell you a little bit about him so you understand. This was not G.I. Joe. This was not Rambo. He was the best forward observer, NCO, in the military. Yes. He had all kinds of medals. I don't know if you can see that last picture over there in the bottom. He couldn't even wear them. He had too many medals. He would have walked all hunched over. Those are all his medals. But he was not that G.I. Joe guy. He was the kid in second grade when the little girl fell in the playground. He was the little boy that ran over and picked her up. Something second graders don't do. They wait for an adult to do. He was the little boy in fifth grade, walking home from school, when he saw a bully take a little boy's bike and throw it in a swamp. And he walked up to the bully, who was at least a foot taller than him, took the bully's bike and threw it in the swamp, and then told the bully to go get both bikes. He was the little boy, or the young man at this point, 16, who when dad came home and went into his bedroom, found that his bed was missing. Where's your bed, Jared? 
Well, Dad, a, a friend of mine was kicked out of his house, and, and he's living and sleeping on the floor. So I thought that he could use the bed more than me. He was a young man at 17 years old who came to Dad and said, Hey, Pop, um, do you mind if I cut down one of those spruce trees in the front yard? You got six of them out there, and I know you want to get rid of them anyway. But me and the guys, we want to have our own Christmas tree. Only to find out that he took that tree and brought it to a woman, a single mom with three kids, who could not afford a tree. And he bought the decorations for her and presents for her and the kids and Christmas dinner for them all and told nobody. He told nobody. He was also a very humble kid. He was a kid who said, hey, 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 Dad, can you drive me to Weymouth? I want to go to a weightlifting competition. Sure, I'll take you. When I dropped him off, he said, um, I said, you want me to wait or you want me to come back? Oh, no, Dad, I'll, I'll get a ride home. Okay. And after he died, and I was cleaning his room, under his bed was a trophy that stood three feet high. A trophy of a weightlifter. And the plaque on it read, first place, New England Weightlifting Championships, Jared Monty. Under 17 division. Can you imagine winning the New England Championships and not telling anybody? He was not the kid that took the trophy and held it in the air. Hey! If you look at any pictures of him, group pictures, school pictures, where is he? Back row, on the side. Very, very humble. He was the kid who in Kosovo, when the young children were going to school, and on the way to school, they had rocks and garbage thrown at them. He was a kid that got up at five o'clock in the morning, took a Humvee, which he wasn't authorized to do, went over, picked the kids up, put them in a the Humvee, and drove them to school so they wouldn't be humiliated. He was the kid who, when you sent him a care package with candy and food and toys and clothes, he was a kid that opened it up and gave it away to everybody. It almost sounds like, hey, wait a minute, no one like, no one does this, no one's like this. Oh, yes, he was. See, he was a kid that lived by three principles. The first principle he lived by was to always try your hardest. And he did. It didn't matter. In sixth grade, he tried out for the middle school basketball team. He was a great basketball player, but he was very short, like his dad. He was the last cut. All his friends decided they were going to quit the team because he was cut, because he was such a great player. But the coach told him, I'm sorry, Monty, you're too short. You can't play basketball. I guess the coach didn't know Isaiah Thomas now, did he? <laughs> but 
But that kid tried out for the team again the next year. And guess what? He was cut again. He didn't give up. He tried out again the next year. He made the team? No. He made team manager. He was allowed to warm up with the team, but they kept the books. Until after the second game when the coach found him a uniform and then started playing him in mop-up time and then realized what a player he had that ended up finishing the year scoring more points than most of the starters. Never give up. Never. No matter what you do. I can't do this math. Yes, you can. Don't give up. Second principle we live by. Always try your hardest. Always. No matter what. Never give 50%. 60, 70, 80, or 90. It's 100% on everything always. You need to do the same thing. Don't get frustrated. Don't get angry. Always try your heart. And his third principle, always do the right thing. Always do the right thing. Some of your peers will humiliate you for doing the right thing, won't they? like you're walking in the parking lot and there's a piece of trash on the ground. And you know the right thing is to pick it up. But when you do that, you're like, what are you, uh, some kind of a trash man or something? No, I'm just doing the right thing. Be polite to your friends, your relatives. People you know, because it's the right thing to do. It's not always the easy thing to do, but it's the right thing to do. Jared spent many times, even in the brig, you know what that is, right? That's the prison they put soldiers in. Yeah, he spent time there. You know why? Because he did the right thing. Only some other officer didn't like what he was doing. I'm maybe taking too much time here. When he was in Korea, he came out of the mess hall. Two guys were having a fight. Well, actually, one guy was having a fight. The other guy was just being beat up on really bad. Now, Jared was an officer. He was an NCO, non-commissioned officer. And the rule is you can't put your hands on any serviceman of lower rank. But this kid was on top of the other kid, wailing on him. The kid was all bloody. Javier went up and said, hey, cut it out, get off him. Soldier didn't listen. So he grabbed him and pushed him up against the wall. And the next day, he was in the commander's office being reprimanded, lost the strike, lost his pay. You touched another soldier. But sir, it was the right thing to do.
So on June 21st, after climbing a mountain 8,500 feet tall, I don't think any of you have ever climbed a mountain that high because there's none around here. The tallest ones we have around here are less than 4,000 feet. 8,500 feet, 100 degree temperature, full uniform, 70 pound, 70 pound pack on your back, three days to climb. They got to the top, they set up an observation point. They were looking down in the valley where the bad guys, the Taliban, were coming in from Pakistan into Afghanistan to do their dastardly deeds. There was an attack that was going to take place in the valley. They needed observers. They were out of food and water. And so they called in a drop. But the helicopter pilot, he missed the coordinates and flew right over them and dropped their supplies. While down below in the valley, a Taliban soldier was watching them. And a few hours later, they came under attack. 16 US soldiers against as many as 80 Taliban soldiers with machine guns, small arms, rocket-propelled grenades. They were surrounded on three sides. One soldier, Patrick Library, behind a rock, kept popping up, shooting at the enemy. One time he popped up, took a bullet right through the head. His mom and I are still very good friends. Another soldier, Derek James, Shot in the back, shot in the wrist. Derek and I are still good friends. Another soldier, Brian Bradbury, was missing. Brian, where are you? Finally, a weak voice. Help me, I'm hit. Jared and his soldiers were behind some rocks. In front of them was an open field with the enemy there, there, and there. They called out to Brian, who answered very weakly. Sergeant Christopher Cunningham looked at Jared and said, hey, I'm going to go get Bradbury. Jared said, no, you're not. He's my guy. I'll get him. So Jared took off the radio phone that he had him on, which he had just used to call back for danger, close fire, artillery, mortars, aircraft. Danger, close means you're sitting there, the bombs are going off over there. You might as well get you as there. Took off his headphones, handed it to another soldier and said, hey, you are now Chaos 3-5. That was Jared's call sign, Chaos 35. And so in order to not break communications, he had the other soldier take his call sign. Tightened up his chin strap, and there is where his life lessons came. From behind the rock, he ran out to try to get Brian. The enemy was shooting at him from three sides. They drove him back behind a rock. Never give up. He rose again for a second time, ran out. 
to get Brian. This time, more enemy were focused on him and drove him back behind the rock again. Life lesson number two. Always try your hardest. And so he rose a third time and went out to get Brian. Life lesson number three. Do the right thing. And on his third attempt, he was hit by an RPG, rocket propelled grenade, and he was killed. He did that for you, and you, and you, and you. Yeah, he did it for you. He didn't know you, but he did it for you, for your freedom. So that you can dress the way you want, wear your hair the way you want, go where you want. Enjoy life. He did it for you. And today I ask you to do something for him. Can you live your life the right way? Can you always try your hardest? Can you never give up? Can you always do the right thing in life? God bless you all. God bless the United States of America. Thank you. So over the past two weeks at lunchtime, we've had uh, a number of our AP students uh, collecting money for the flags for the cemeteries of the Bourne National Cemetery. So we are very proud to say that we have a check for Mr. Monty and the flags for veterans. And Mr. Monty, this is from the O'Donnell Middle School students and staff. Mr. Monty, I'd like to present you with that check for the Operation Flags for Veterans program. And David, I'd like to present you with a plaque to commemorate my son. This will be displayed in a very prominent place in the school, and hopefully when you see this, not only this year, but when you come back to visit, you'll think about this day. So we hope that for you. Um, so as Ms. Valer mentioned earlier in the presentation, um, Mr. Monty was actually being interviewed on radio um, talking about his son's truck, which he drove here today, and it still seems to be in very good working condition. Um, so Mr. Monty drives Jared's truck. He still drives it, and that's, that's, that was very meaningful to this um, songwriter um, that heard Mr. Monty being interviewed on radio. And Mr. Monty's interview in Jared's story became part of this song, I Drive Your Truck by Lee Bryce. And Ms. Valer and I thought it would be a wonderful way to conclude our program today by having our chorus sing, I Drive Your Truck. And um, Ms. Bowman um, was able to organize the chorus and she was able to get them prepared for that. So I'm gonna turn it over to Ms. Bowman and the eighth grade chorus.
Thank you, eighth grade chorus. Another round of applause for our wonderful eighth grade chorus led by Miss Betty Bowman. Outstanding. Again, thank you to everyone that made today's program possible. Thank you again to Mr. Monty, our keynote speaker. Thank you, Mr. Monty, for being back in Stoughton with us this morning.